on News 10 NBC Decision 2014 Special. The race for the New York State 55th District Senate seat. Democrat Ted O'Brien faces a challenge from Republican Rich Funky. Now to our moderator, News 10 NBC anchor Scott Kilberry. Well, thank you for joining us for our debate in the 55th State Senate District race. It's part of our commitment to you as your election station. First, let's give you some background on the candidates in this race. Incumbent Democratic Senator Ted O'Brien and Republican challenger Rich Funky. Now, Rich Funky was born in Batavia. He's a graduate of Adelphi University. Funky retired after a 44-year career in broadcasting. In the interest of full disclosure, most of his career was here at WHEC. He lives in Fairport with his wife, Patricia. Ted O'Brien is currently serving his first term as a state senator. He's a Union College and Syracuse University graduate. O'Brien is an attorney and former Monroe County legislator. He lives in Irondequoit with his wife, Sue. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us here tonight. Now, both men are running to represent New York's 55th district in the state Senate, a seat that could very well decide which party controls the Senate for the next two years. The district stretches from Lake Ontario. It's pretty big. It goes up from the uh, Rondequoy border, makes its way down to Ontario on the Steuben County line. The district includes a portion of the city of Rochester, as well as the communities of Penfield, East Rochester, Parenton, Pittsford, Rush, Menden, East and West Bloomfield, Richmond, Bristol, and South Bristol, Canadice, and Naples. Now, we want to take a moment to go over the rules set forth by us and agreed to, on by both the candidates. In the interest of fairness, a series of coin flips determine the order in which we're doing things. A coin flip has determined who will deliver opening and closing statements first and who will be fielding the first question. Each candidate will be given a minute and a half for opening statements and a minute for closing statements. Now there will also be facing questions from members of our panel. After each candidate is asked a question, he will then have one minute to respond. And in my discretion as moderator, candidates will have 30 seconds to respond to claims by their opponent. And we'll also ask questions posed to us by you, our viewers, on Facebook and Twitter. Now, those questions will be posed to both candidates, and each candidate will have, once again, one minute to respond. Again, candidates will have 30 seconds to respond at my discretion. Now, we also want to take a moment now to introduce our panelists who are sitting right here, joining us from the Rochester Business Journal, Tom Adams. Next to him is reporter Julie Julie is actually uh, from the Messenger Post, Julie Sherwood, and uh, News 10 NBC anchor and reporter Jen Mobilia. So we begin with the opening statements now that are be delivered by the challenger Republican Rich Funky. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. I spent 40 years in front of these cameras sharing your stories and digging for the truth. And when I decided to run for the state senate, a lot of people asked me why. I love this community, and I've always tried to give back, like raising money for Golisano Children's Hospital, Camp Good Days, Ronald McDonald House, and many others. And that's what public service is about. That's what public office is supposed to be about. We all want lower taxes, more good-paying careers, a quality education for our children. But we've been getting the short end of the stick from the career politicians in Albany. As your senator, I'll fight to cut taxes and restore those star rebate checks for homeowners so hardworking families can build a future here. And senior citizens and young New Yorkers won't have to move out of our state. I'm going to fight for every job we have, work to create new ones, and invest in workforce training for those advanced manufacturing jobs. And I'll replace Common Core with common sense and team with parents and educators to make sure we have the best schools possible. Right now, we're being shortchanged on state education aid, which hurts our schools, and state economic aid, which hurts our growth. That's our money in Albany. And I'm going to fight for our fair share. I'll never let politics get in the way of progress. And I'll support a true women's equality agenda with protection from workplace discrimination and equal pay for equal work. I've had a great career, loved every minute of it here. Now it's time to give back. Like I've said, I'm not going to Albany to be something. I'm going to Albany to do something, to fight for the people I love. I want to thank News 10 NBC for giving me this opportunity. All right. Thank you, Mr. Funky. And now the incumbent, Senator Ted O'Brien. I'm Senator Ted O'Brien, and I'm running for re-election because the challenges you face are the same ones Sue and I deal with every day. I grew up in this community, got married here, started a business here, and have my daughters in public schools here. These experiences have shaped my priorities. Lower taxes, more jobs, better schools, and equality for all New Yorkers. I've delivered on these issues, which is why groups that often disagree agree 
about me, like the labor community and the Rochester Business Alliance. In this debate, I'll tell you all about what I've accomplished in my first term and what I plan to do in my second. I'll tell you how I raised the minimum wage and how I ended the tax on upstate manufacturers. I'll tell you why we need to pass the Women's Equality Act and why we should pass my bill to take tax breaks away from companies that ship jobs overseas. I'll tell you because candidates for office should tell the people they want to represent where they stand on the issues. Let me make a prediction. In this debate, Rich Funky will not tell you much. It's been his strategy this entire campaign. Rich sticks, sticks to vague, carefully crafted talking points. He's looking to ride his celebrity so he can avoid explaining positions that are simply out of touch, like why he opposes Roe v. Wade and why he wants to repeal reasonable laws that reduce gun violence. You know the stakes are high in this election and that you deserve a state center you can count on to lower the cost of living, create good new jobs, and improve our public schools. For the last two years, that's exactly what I've done, what I'll continue to do when I'm reelected. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Now let's begin with the question portion of our debate. We begin with our panel. Uh, Tom Adams from the Rochester Business Journal has our first question. Thanks, Scott. Each of you has tax relief at the top of your campaign platform. I'm wondering specifically what would each of you do to reduce taxes, including which taxes you would target, which would be uh, how you would prioritize that, and then what makes you the better candidate? This question is to me. <clears throat> um, in my first uh, term in the State Senate, I understood that the biggest obstacle we have to having our region really flourish uh, as a region is the tax climate in New York. And that's why I delivered $1.5 billion in property tax relief to New Yorkers and why we reduced the income tax rates on middle class families to the lowest rates we've had in, in 60 years. I also reduced the, uh, the tax on upstate manufacturers to zero. Those are the kind of things that we have to do uh, to make our, our economy flourish here in, in this region. But there's more work to be done. That's why I want to get back to Albany and pass my uh, Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, which will, is, is the one vehicle that really gives us long-term property tax relief. Things that uh, I know and going door to door is foremost on people's minds. And we, if we can get uh, this act passed, then we can really deal with the biggest problem we have in terms of being competitive with other areas in the nation, and that's our property tax climate. We are uh, number one in taxes, and we are number 50 in the entire nation in, in uh, our prospects for economic growth. And obviously that is unacceptable. Uh, mandates are a big issue. Uh, if I go to Albany, when I go to Albany, I'm going to uh, uh, make certain that we never again sign a piece of legislation that shifts the cost of something down to uh, taxpayers in Monroe and Ontario counties. That's uh, completely unacceptable. If somebody has a good program in Albany, they're going to need to pay for that program in Albany. The burden of that is not going to be shifted down to Monroe County. I'm in favor of the 2% tax cap. My opponent had an opportunity uh, to make the 2% tax cap permanent and voted twice not to do that. I'm in favor of eliminating the gap elimination adjustment, which has robbed $57 million from our school districts. Uh, my opponent had an opportunity to uh, deal with that as well and chose uh, not to make a hard and fast end to gap elimination adjustment. So there are all sorts of things that we can do on the tax side, and those are just two of them right there. But cutting taxes is a major priority. If we can't cut taxes, we can't grow businesses. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Now we're going to turn to Julie Sherwood for our next question. I'd like to know where each of you stands on uh, permitting shale gas drilling in New York State, and uh, specifically, if it is permitted, what you would do to protect your constituents from potential environmental hazards. Well, uh, we have a district that's defined by water. It's our most precious natural resource in the 55th district, extending all the way from Irondequite all the way down to Naples. Lake Ontario, Genesee River, uh, Canandaigua Lake, uh, Canandaise Lake, Honey Oil Lake, Aranaquoit Bay. I'm going to do everything in my power to make certain that our water is clean. Uh, here's the issue. The issue is that our watershed protect, protection in, in the 55th district is not what it is in New York City. And I would have hoped that my opponent would have fought harder uh, in Albany to have the similar protections for our watershed in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes as is the case in downstate New York. I don't believe that shale drilling is right for the 55th district. I just don't think it is. Um, and so I want those protections in place for our watershed. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the way I feel about it right now. Senator O'Brien. Thank you. Yes, um, 
I was recently appointed to be the ranking member in the State Senate's Environmental Conservation Committee. And one of the very first things I did was hold public hearings on the fracking issue. And one of the things we determined that I think a lot of people are surprised about is that even though we don't have high volume hydrofracking in our state now, we're taking waste from states like Pennsylvania that do. They're being deposited in our landfills right now. And uh, this is a, a, something that we really have to, to, to change. Um, I have several concerns. Right now, the Department of Health is undergoing an extensive study on whether or not hydrofracking, high volume hydrofracking, is appropriate for New York State. Uh, but even if the conclusion somehow is that there are ways that it could be done safely, I still have grave reservations. First, we have to decide what we're going to do with the wastewater. Millions of gallons of wastewater that uh, need to be disposed of. Pennsylvania won't accept them in their own wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, and so that's a significant issue. And we also have to determine whether or not we're going to have the resources as a state to regulate an industry that probably shouldn't be self-regulated. So I, th I think there's serious concerns uh, about fracking in our state. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Now our next question comes to us from News 10 NBC's Jennifer Mobilia. Why all the negative attack ads? Rather than spending all this time and money attacking each other, why not simply tell the voters where you stand on the issues in the clear path you'll take to get the job done? You know, I'm sure we're both somewhat disappointed in the, in the tone of, uh, of the campaigns. And that's why I've really encouraged my opponent to come out to public forums instead of just relying on the highly scripted, highly polished uh, TV ads that have been the, the tenor of his campaign. Um, I, I believe that we really should be out talking to people about the issues that are important to them. And that's why in the last several weeks, I've been to six different public forums sponsored by everything from things, places like the Anthony Jordan Health Center to the Ronaquik Chamber of Commerce to the Ronaquik Kiwanis and others. Um, I think that's the best way that we, so we don't have to rely on these, these ads. But I have to tell you, one of the ads is, I think, one of the worst ads I've ever seen. Uh, I think it's absolutely disgusting to use victims of child abuse to score political points. And uh, I think that uh, my opponent, unfortunately, his own campaign fielded that, and I think it's a new low. Well, negative advertising uh, began uh, with Ted's campaign. That's how he started, and that's how he's ending in this campaign. We've tried to keep this campaign at a high level. We have gone out and talked to uh, people throughout the district since March about the issues. Uh, he's complaining about public forums. He complained at the Rotary Club uh, uh, last week uh, about uh, a lack of debates, and here we were debating, and now he's complaining again. Here we are debating, and you're complaining that we're not having these, these forums. This is as big a public forum as you could possibly have. Finally, uh, it's been, it's been wonderful to go out and talk to people in the 55th district to listen to their concerns, and all of them have said, please keep it at a high level at a positive level. That's what we've tried to do with the ads that we've put out there. I've talked about the issues in those ads from tax relief to uh, education uh, funding. Uh, and so I don't know, you know where that's coming from, but we've tried to keep it at a high level. Uh, that's what I insisted upon with my campaign, and that's where we are right now. Scott, that's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. He's been attacking me with robocalls, Facebook postings, mailing since January. And uh, if anybody started uh, with negative campaigning, it was Rich Funky's campaign. And uh, we tried to take the high road. Yes, I had an ally that was, I can't coordinate with that ran an ad that I thought was unfortunate. But uh, by the same token, I think his response has been even more unfortunate. He's defending comments. Sometimes as a state senator, you have to rise above the kind of locker room mentality that continues to demean women. And uh, I just think it's a, a very unfortunate that, that his campaign has, has stooped to such lows. Well, you know as well as I do that that ad was uh, run by you, and those it comments were taken me. completely out of lie. context. Well, Mr. Funky, we'll give you 30 seconds here. Expenditure. Then you should have stood up and said something about and it. You should that take time. off your ad that accuses me. Of, uh, well, we'll give, we'll give Mr. Funky 30 abuse. seconds here. Mr. Funky, go ahead with 30 seconds to respond to well, Senator Bryan. As I said before, if if you if you didn't like the ad that was run against me, you could have called a news conference, which you're very good at doing, and you could have said something about it at the time. We've tried to keep our ads at a high level. That's where they are. And Senator O'Brien, he did say that uh, you started the negative campaigning and your, your response to that is... I, I, I completely disagree that uh, our campaign, he's been doing robocalls accusing uh, of my uh, campaign volunteers of doing illegal things. Uh, the Facebook posting has been particularly ugly. The mailings have been terrible. And, and now for him to his own campaign is funding what I think is the worst campaign ad I've ever seen, where he's 
I just think it's absolutely disgusting to use the victims of child abuse to score political points, particularly when I've worked so hard to highlight and support the efforts done by Bavona and other people that are working in the industry of child abuse. Mr. Funky, do you have a response or would you like to move forward? Okay. Ted's votes are his votes. All right. Well, we are actually just getting started right here. In fact, after the break, you're going to hear more from the candidates, including questions posed by you, our viewers, so you want to stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our debate. Uh, the Senate District, 55th uh, Senate District, is it's between the Democratic Senator Ted O'Brien and Republican challenger Rich Funky. Now, all day we've been asking you, the viewers, to submit your questions to our candidates uh, via the social media. And this one comes from David Schneiderman, who is asking, what should be the level of minimum wage? How did you arrive at that number? And how should it be calculated in the future? This is from David Snyderman through our Facebook page, and this first response is going to come from Mr. Funky. The uh, minimum wage at the end of next year is going to go up to $9 an hour. Uh, I would not oppose a further increase in the minimum wage. Uh, however, what I have said about this is that I think all the stakeholders need to come to the table because uh, if it's going to cost businesses an extra 30 percent or whatever that number is going to be for their businesses, then I think there ought, there ought to be some relationship between raising the minimum wage and doing something for business. It ought to happen in tandem. So if there's a tax credit or something of that nature that might be available for business after they increase the minimum wage, uh, then maybe we should consider that, bring all stakeholders to the table. Uh, the other part about this is that we talk a lot about minimum wage, but what we should be talking about are raising wages to an acceptable level uh, so that families can prosper in, in this state. We should be talking about workforce development and things of that nature to get people off minimum wage jobs and into uh, jobs where they can raise their families, support their families, and have a bright future. All right, thank you, Mr. Funky. Now, Senator O'Brien, your response. We fought so hard in my first term in the Senate t to get uh, a, a, the start of a minimum wage increase. And unfortunately, we were blocked for giving a meaningful winning wage increase by the folks that Rich wants to join in, in the state Senate and the Republican conference. Um, I think it's unconscionable when somebody works a 40-hour week and can't even sustain themselves. And the thing is that when I, we can have all the discussions you want with, 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 with people. I've already met with economists right here in Rochester and, and talked to them about the fact that we still have weakness in our economy and the stimulative effect that comes when you pay the lowest wage earners a little bit more in their paycheck, that goes right back into the economy and helps our economy grow. And so there's still room. The, the other thing is when, when you have a fast food worker or somebody at Walmart making a minimum wage, they're not making enough to get themselves off of public assistance. And I, I think it just behooves us to be much smarter about raising the minimum wage. When I go back to uh, the Senate in, in January, I'm committed to giving us a meaningful minimum wage increase. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we have another question from our viewers. This one comes from Larkin Pod. This is, uh, once again, from uh, Facebook. Poverty rates in Rochester, over 25%, and one in five children at the risk of hunger. What would you do to address hunger in our community? Once again, this is from Larkin Pod, and this question goes to Senator O'Brien. I'm so glad that this question came up because it's really been something that, uh, that we, we need to address as a, as a, a community. And, and one of the, our biggest shames is that in the city of Rochester, we rank second worst in the nation in terms of children growing up in poverty. And uh, frankly, Republicans in the state Senate have shown great indifference, even neglect, to this kind of issue. And that's the kind of indifference that I, I'm sorry to say is evidenced by uh, Mr. Funky's own website where he lists, welcome to the 55th Senate District. He lists every single town and village from Arondequoit to Naples. And guess what he neglected to mention? That the city of Rochester with 81,000 residents in the city of Rochester living there wasn't even mentioned as being in the district. That's not necessarily uh, something he intended to do, but it does show that we're not, here's the greatest need we have is supporting children in poverty. And it's, it doesn't even recognize that the city of Rochester is in the district. I think it's shameful. We have so much more to do. And that's why I've supported programs to help children. All right, Mr. Funky. You know, I've worked in downtown Rochester for almost 40 years. I think that I know that uh, Rochester is part of the 55th district. Didn't our energy it. and our pride uh, comes out of the city of Rochester. Whether you're from Greece or whether you're from Pittsburgh or whether you're from Victor, you understand that when you leave this community and you go someplace else and somebody asks you where you're from, you're likely you're going to say Rochester, New York. Uh, it would be an embarrassment for somebody to then, to then say to you, oh, well, you're, uh, you know, you're the fourth worst city in America uh, when it comes to poverty. 
look at this is a regional issue it isn't just a city of rochester issue we need to get our arms around this we need to have the suburbs involved in this discussion as well because it is it is unconscionable that people should be hungry in this city we live in a wonderful town a very giving town um, you know a wealthy town in many respects and it's time that all of us came together and got our arms around this uh, circumstance it is about jobs and it is about the economy and the only thing that's going to get you out of poverty is a great job and workforce development is important all right thank you mr Scott, funky you know if i could just respond you know I, i'm sure that mr funky knows that the city of rochester is included in the district what i'm suggesting is that when we have such great need when you do a scripted campaign video and post it on your campaign site not some extemporaneous uh, remark but you post it and, and on your after a carefully tailored web uh, video and you don't mention that the city of Rochester is in the district. It shows what your, where your priorities are, what you're thinking of. And uh, that's why I, I, I raise that point, because I think it's very important. We've had a Republican Senate that has shown great indifference to the city of Rochester. Mr. Funky, your response. <laughs> Look, at everybody knows that Rochester is in the 55th district. The questions that I always get asked are what towns are in the 55th district. The assumption is, of course, the city of Rochester is part of this district. We all know that. So when you do a, something on your Facebook page, and the question is what towns are represented, you go through the towns. That's the way it is. Okay, well we'll take more questions and pose them to the candidates from our viewers in just a moment, but right now we're switching back to our panelists. We're gonna begin with Tom Adams once again from the Rochester Business Journal. In terms of job creation and growing the local economy, each of you has outlined a, a general strategy for making things better around here. Rich, you cite the state's regulatory environment and promise to try to change that and Ted you've talked to your three-pronged approach which I better do this correctly so I an innovation based economy supporting tourism training and training job seekers for higher demand jobs um, I wonder if each of you could talk about your strategies for implementing those changes we'll start with mr. funky uh, you know workforce development is a huge a huge part of this uh, we have eight area colleges uh, in our region uh, that are that are crucial to that uh, we have great resources here we have you know wonderful hospitals we have wonderful colleges we have great businesses uh, big businesses and small businesses and statewide business has supported me in this effort uh, workforce development is the hugest part of this whole component we have 10,000 jobs that are available right now in the city of Rochester and, and the surrounding area that we can't find people to fill uh, those positions, whether it's in tool and die or whether it's in advanced manufacturing. We have to do more on the vocational side uh, within our school districts to train people for these jobs. Uh, we need to put more money into workforce development and continue to uh, foster these relationships between the colleges and between uh, young people who want to have these jobs and have successful careers. And that's up to the state to do that. Thank you, Mr. Funke. Mr. O'Brien. Workforce development is critically important, and that's why I brought millions of dollars into the district last year and during my first term uh, to support workforce development efforts. And Mr. Funke is correct. I think the number is more like 16,000 jobs right now that could be filled in advanced uh, technology where people need uh, employees with a little bit more than high school education, but they don't need people graduating with master's in engineering degrees. Those middle skills jobs are critically important. Uh, but to fix our economy and really get it to grow and, and, and really create jobs, we've got to start with the tax climate in New York. That's where we really are um, not competitive with the rest of the nation, and particularly the property tax. Uh, but there's another important distinction between uh, Mr. Funky and myself in, in terms of job creation, and that has to do with leveraging our colleges and universities with the Startup New York program, which he thinks is convoluted, he said last week. I think it's different than other kinds of tax programs in that it leverages the advantage we have in this region, which is research being done at uh, our colleges and universities, which the, the commercialization and manufacturing of breakthroughs has been done in other communities. It should be doing right here. That's what Startup okay. New York lets us do. All right. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, Mr. Funky, would you like to respond? Well, I would. I'm in favor of anything that will cut taxes and create jobs, and that includes Startup New York. He has misrepresented my position on that as well. But that's just one component of creating jobs and a better business climate uh, in this state. The other part of that is cutting taxes across the board uh, for businesses and looking at what we can do to, uh, to help them survive and, and help them stay in New York State. We're losing too many businesses to other states in this country. We have to have an across-the-board 
look at what we can do to make New York State competitive with the North Carolinas and the Floridas. All right, thank you. You know, if, and if I could just res respond, sure, respond go ahead, to that, Mr. because he said he supports startup New York, and that wasn't always his position. In fact, in the city newspaper, he questioned the wisdom of Governor Cuomo's startup New York program, um, and said we shouldn't be giving away the store. Uh, so you know, he has a different approach uh, now. But my approach to job creation has been validated really by my endorsement from the yeah. business community. I have the support of the labor community and also the Rochester Business Alliance, who's supporting my efforts at, at meaningful job creation in our area. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Brien. All right, now we have more questions from our panelists, uh, Julie Sherwood of the Messenger Post. Uh, I'd like you each to explain your position on the Women's Equality Act and specifically uh, the tenth point, which is, uh, deals with abortion. We'll begin with uh, Mr. O'Brien. Right. The, the Women's Equality Act uh, is stalled in the, in the um, state Senate because of a, a difference of opinion that r many Republicans have, and, and Mr. Funky shares the same belief that Roe v. Wade is bad law. And I believe that uh, the protections of Roe v. Wade should be included in New York state law for a very simple reason. Right now, the Supreme Court of the United States is making some suggestions. They may turn this issue over to the states. And if we do that, we need to protect the rights that women have right now in New York state. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about, you know, what, that it would be some great expansion. It's not at all true. In fact, I have the tenth point here with me. We can read it together if we'd like. It simply is a codification of Roe v. Wade that makes uh, a woman's right to choose the law of the land in New York State. And that's, that's all it does. So to hold the other nine points hostage by saying, women, you can only have the other nine points if you give up rights that you currently have under current law now, I think is unfair to women. Mr. Funky. Mr. O'Brien's been on this anti-woman uh, campaign uh, since the beginning of uh, this campaign. I'm proud of my uh, accomplishments. I've, I'm, I'm proud of uh, uh, my record of uh, providing opportunities uh, for women in the Rochester area. I was able to, uh, I was the first one to begin covering women's sports when everybody was covering the guys. I started a women's sports luncheon here that was, uh, uh, got nationwide attention. Uh, and I think a lot of parents out there appreciate the fact that I did. Look at, let's get the nine laws that everybody agrees on, uh, on the books. Equal pay for equal work, protections against workplace discrimination, sexual harassment, sex trafficking, domestic violence, uh, pregnancy discrimination. Uh, they have been held hostage for two years by my opponent's side. And this is law that could have been put in place two years ago and wasn't. And if you'd like to see the other nine points that you've held hostage, I've got them right here, and you can take a look at them. Scott, Senator Bryan, just, go ahead. It's just simply not true. Uh, all nine points came to the Senate uh, last year. I supported all nine points. All nine points became, came to the Senate again this year. I've done what I can as a Senate. I supported all nine points every time it's come before me. Uh, but the, the problem has been this intransigence about insisting that Roe v. Wade is bad law, and it's a position that's far to the right of even most Republicans, and to say that you can't have your first nine rights, women, unless you give up rights that you currently have under existing law now is unconscionable in my view. All right, thank you, Mr. Only in Albany could you agree on 90 percent of a piece of legislation and not have it go into effect over one piece of legislation that there's disagreement on. Exactly. But I'll tell you what, that's one piece out of ten. And I'll tell you what, you have bipartisan opposition to the piece of legislation that you are proposing. And that comes from an assemblywoman in downstate New York who said by her own admission that the Democrats were doing this simply for political reasons. And that's what you have right now. Let's get them passed, separated, right. let's get the nine Thank passed, you. and that's what I'll do. You know, the Assembly has passed all ten points, uh, and, uh, and maybe we need to educate you on, on how a law becomes, a, uh, how a bill becomes a law in New York State, but we have to replicate what was done in the Assembly. What I've done as a Senator is pass all nine every time it's come before me, and, uh, and, and I can't be responsible for what the Assembly is doing, but uh, anyway, you can blame Assembly leadership if you like, but what, what is true for what we can do in the Senate is pass all ten points to replicate what was done in the Senate, get a bill to the, to the governor for signature, and the reason that we don't is because you are insisting right, that we take we rights away forward. from women that they currently question, have now. We're going to take our next Laws question. On the books. Our next question from our panel is uh, Jennifer Mobile of News 10 NBC. This question is in regard to our parole system. Here in Rochester, we have two suspects, one accused of raping a teenage girl, the other accused of killing a Rochester police officer. Both 
both men were out of prison on parole when they allegedly committed these crimes. What changes would you make to the current parole system to better protect our children and our community? What I would do is get rid of indeterminate sentences where a judge is sentencing somebody from two and a half to five or two and a half to seven or whatever. We need truth in sentencing laws in the state of New York so that a judge can meet out either a minimum sentence or a maximum sentence. That's what I would propose. Uh, and good time behavior and all the rest of this stuff, you know, if you need an incentive to behave yourself in prison, then the incentive ought to be, we'll tack on another year if you don't. But indeterminate sentences are a big reason why there's confusion over the parole system and a big reason why we have things happening in our community that are happening uh, right now. We need to do everything we can to protect uh, men, women, and children in our community uh, from those who commit violent crime. And this is one way to do it. All right, thank you. Mr. O'Brien. You know, this is one of the areas where I think Rich and I agree. Um, indeterminate sentences has been a problem, particularly for violent crimes. Um, we need to have clear legislation that's going to keep people locked up um, when, they, when they have a propensity to commit violence. Um, you know, sadly, we've lost a, a police officer here in our community by someone who probably should have still been in jail. And uh, I think we can agree that, uh, that, that we need to make sure that those kind of violent felons aren't out roaming our streets and creating chaos and murder. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Still ahead, where do the candidates stand on Common Core, the SAFE Act, and local funding from the state? We're going to ask them when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to our coverage of the 55th State Senate District Debate. We have more questions from our panelists. Here's reporter Tom Adams of the Rochester Business Journal. In terms of state funding, uh, I'm wondering if uh, each of you feel like this region is shortchanged when it comes to funding from Albany, and if so, what do you plan to do about it? And, and if not, there does seem to be that misperception. Why is that misperception out there? We'll begin with uh, Senator O'Brien. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, we really haven't been uh, getting our fair share of funding uh, for, for quite a long time. Uh, during the whole period, most of the last 50 years have been controlled by Republicans. And um, this year, uh, in, the, in the Senate uh, budget proposal, they were going to send $200 million in aid to municipalities to New York City and not a penny to any upstate cities. And uh, I had to vote against that. I just didn't think uh, this has been a biggest problem uh, in state allocation of resources. And it's just uh, it's not uh, been fair to our, to our region. And, and so I voted against that, that the, the Republican budget bill and went on newsprint and uh, 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 television talking about the fact that we needed a bill that was fair to us and I actually got six million dollars allocated to uh, the city of Rochester and I think when we talk about the upstate downstate divide I think what's very uh, telling is the comment made by the not by a Democrat the state Senate GOP spokesperson Scott Reef said you're talking about a party the Republican Party that sets the agenda towards Long Island when dividing resources okay that's not fair to us and we need to do a lot better thank you Senator O'Brien Mr. Funky well, we've been in a 10-year decline, uh, downsizing here in, uh, in the Rochester, greater Rochester area, and we have not gotten our fair share of state economic development aid, and that's something that we have to uh, obviously uh, go in and fight for. Uh, Buffalo got a billion dollars. Uh, what did we get? Nothing close to it. So uh, that has to do with uh, representation. It has to do with understanding that as a state senator, you're representing this district first. Uh, you're representing Monroe and Ontario counties. You're not here to represent New York City. You're not here to represent Long Island and Westchester County. You're here to represent this area first and to go down to Albany and fight for every last dollar that you can get for economic development aid in our community. Uh, Mr. O'Brien talks about $400 million. Maybe you could have done something about this. $400 million in pre-K money went down to New York City in the metropolitan area and only $40 million to upstate New York. You had an opportunity to do something about that, and you didn't. Scott, if I could just sure, respond go ahead. to that, because uh, you know, this same uh, budget bill that the Republicans proposed, and remember, five of the six senators are in the Republican conference here, that proposal was going to send more money to largely New York City charter schools, the same group that are now funding his campaign, than was going to be added to education statewide, and pu public education statewide. And I think it's absolutely outrageous to suggest that me as a Democrat have done, ever done anything but advocate as loudly as I can for the people of the 55th Senate District. Those are the only 
only people I represent, period. And Mr. Funky, how do you this, respond to this? This is a battle between upstate and downstate, and the people who uh, support uh, Mr. O'Brien are the downstate politicians. There's no question about that. So this, is about, this is about upstate and, and the values that we have in upstate New York, and all of us coming together uh, in upstate New York. Uh, when I'm elected, we'll have six state senators uh, touching Monroe County in the Republican Party. We should be able to form a power block here to uh, f battle for our own interests here and not those of downstate, which seem to be more important to Mr. O'Brien. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. This is from Julie Sherwood of the Messenger Post. Uh, I'd like to know where each of you stands on the Common Core standards and what is your response to opponents of the standards or opponents of how they're being implemented? We'll begin with Mr. Funky. Uh, I'm not a supporter of Common Core. I've said that from the very beginning. I don't believe that one size fits all education, top down education, is uh, great for our kids. When, when a third grader is being tested for seven hours, that, that seems to be a little crazy to me. I have a number of teachers on my side of the family. I counted them up the other day, we had like seven. And I can tell you, I get an earful from them uh, when they begin to talk about uh, Common Core. It takes creativity out of the classroom. We're teaching to a test. The rollout was horrible. We need to scrap Common Core, and we need to uh, uh, start over. We don't have so much a standards problem, it seems to me, in the state of New York, as we have an achievement problem, and only in some school districts. You wouldn't say that about West Arundaquoit or Pittsford or uh, some of our Brighton. We need to look at what works there, replicate what's going on in those school districts, and, uh, and show that to other school districts. And we also need to eliminate gap elimination adjustment to provide more school aid for our schools. Thank you, Mr. Funky. Senator O'Brien. One of the great advantages I've had as a state legislature is that I'm the father of two young daughters in public schools right now. And as a result of that, I've been able to understand about how implementation of Common Core has gone. And frankly, my young daughter, after two days of marathon testing, came home and was very stressed and very anxious. And she looked me in the eye and she said, you're a state senator, do something about it. And I take that responsibility very seriously, not only for my daughter, but for, uh, for all of our children. Uh, I'm the only person uh, in this debate who's actually worked on straightening out the mess that Common Core implementation has been. I've taken away uh, the, the uh, punishing uh, high stakes consequences for standardized testing from our students and from our teachers. And we were getting a lot of comments uh, from parents about standardized test questions. Um, they're saying that we need to be able to see what after exams are done, what the questions and the answers are so we can meet with teachers and determine whether what's being taught in the classroom meets with what's being tested for. I went to the Department of Education and got them to release okay. half the questions, a very good start. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Funky, would you like to respond to his, uh, his uh, experience he's talking about here on the Common Core? Once again, I say that it's a top-down uh, method of education. Um, it's a one-size-fits-all uh, theory, and I don't believe it works. It doesn't work in the classroom. You know, teachers know best. We need local control in our school districts, and it, it, it shouldn't come in this fashion. Okay, thank you. Do now, I have a chance to respond to? Uh, we're going to move on. We're tight on time, up against the clock right now. We're going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Jennifer Mobilia of News 10 NBC. Gentlemen, do you support the state's SAFE Act as it is today, or do you think some changes need to be made, and if so, what changes? And uh, I guess, is this question to be first? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, I, I, with respect to the, the uh, reasonable gun legislation, um, I think we have to recognize that we're dealing with rampant gun violence, not only in, in our city, in our state, but in our nation. Uh, in the first 70 weeks following Sandy Hook school shootings, we had school shootings in 74 different times, more than once a week. And, and actually, since the last time we were uh, together, we've had two more shootings in schools. And I think we have to recognize that there is a, a terrible uh, problem with gun violence. Is the answer only reasonable gun restrictions? No, we have a lot of access to mental health issues and other things. But it has to uh, be a component of reasonable restrictions on gun ownership. And I, you know, I don't want to turn gun owners into criminals, but I also don't want to turn criminals into gun owners. And what the SAFE Act does is try to keep the hands of uh, the most dangerous 
weapons out of the out of violent criminals and out of people with mental health uh, issues. That's why the Safe Act provides for things like background checks, and there's okay. a whole litany of things that are Thank very you. very important that we include. Thank you, Senator Bride. Mr. I'm Trump, troubled by the violence in our community. Uh, we have laws in the books, and we have to do more to enforce those laws and make certain that. Uh, uh, illegal guns are kept out of the hands of, of violent people and criminal uh, people. Uh, look at, I spent almost 40 years of my life operating under the First Amendment uh, right here. I'm certainly not going to turn my back on the Second Amendment. Mr. O'Brien campaigned the last time that he ran as a Second Amendment supporter and on the very first day of his term in office he turned his back on all of those folks who supported him and believe in the Second Amendment and he voted for the SAFE Act. This is a piece of legislation that had no consultation with law enforcement, no consultation with judges, no consultation with county clerks. And it did, in fact, turn law-abiding citizens into criminals overnight. We need to repeal the SAFE Act. We need to start over. We need to protect law enforcement and first responders. We, we, we're okay with background checks for, for those. And we need to uh, uh, make certain that we respect the like, rights of law-abiding citizens and deal with the mentally ill and make sure that they don't have weapons. Okay, thank you, Mr. Funky. Mr. O'Brien, you want to respond? I, I do. You know, I, it is true that one of the very first uh, votes I had to take in the state Senate was on uh, reasonable gun restrictions, and uh, it's Mr. Funky's party that put, decided when we were going to vote on it, what was going to be in it, and pushed it right, right through, uh, n not my party. Uh, but with respect to the Second Amendment, even the most conservative judge on the Supreme Court has said that nothing in the Second Amendment means we can't have reasonable restric restrictions on gun ownership. That's the law of the land. And to suggest that I somehow don't respect the Second Amendment, I do. I just don't want criminals to having access to guns. All right, we do thank have you, reasonable Mr. gun owner. Uh, we do have reasonable gun laws on the books here. And uh, parts of this legislation have already been ruled unconstitutional and unenforceable. It's time to start over. Okay. Thank you, both candidates. Of course, we have much more still ahead. We're going to hear some closing thoughts from both of them. When we come back, please stay with us. And welcome back to our 55th Senate District debate between Democratic Senator Ted O'Brien and Republican challenger Rich Funky. Now, all day we've been asking you, the viewers, to submit your questions to our candidates. Now we turn to our last question from the viewer. Robert Sheffs is asking, why does New York require a car inspection every year when other states do not? We'll begin with Mr. Funky. <laughs> All right. Good question. I don't know that I've got a great answer for you there, except for the fact that New York uh, sees it as a revenue booster. I do think some adjustments to that uh, could certainly be made. I mean, if you're leasing a new car, I don't know that you have to have it uh, inspected each and every year, but it's certainly something that uh, I'd be willing to take a look at in Albany. If you've got a car that's uh, 15 years old, there's got to be some relationship between an old car and a brand new car. And I don't think all of them have to be inspected each and every year unless it's just a matter of the state of New York needing the money. All right, Mr. Funky, thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Well, I, I do think that you know our top priority as state senator has to be public safety, and there is this public safety element. We know that a lot of repairs only get done when uh, when the, a car is taken into a, a repair shop for an inspection. Uh, I do think that we could look at having some flexibility, however, particularly with new cars, um, and maybe have instead of annual, uh, maybe the first two years for a new car, um, it, you don't need to have an inspection. Uh, so I, I think. We don't want to make it just a revenue producer for the state. Uh, that's not what the intent of the legislation should be. We do want to make sure we keep our highways safe. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Now we're going to turn it over to the closing statements. We begin with Mr. Funky. Thanks, Scott. We face some serious challenges, from a changing economy to unacceptable levels of poverty, the need for stronger schools, lower taxes, and more jobs. We need a state senator to go to Albany and give us a fighting chance. I believe the future is bright in our community, but we have been shortchanged from school aid to economic development funding. Where's our Rochester billion like Buffalo's? We have to make job creation our priority, and that begins by lowering taxes, getting spending under control, and we need a senator who fights for our schools. I will eliminate the GEA, and I will get us our fair share. I won't ever let politics stand in the way of good ideas like an equal pay law for women. Look, I've said it before. I'm not a career politician. I'm just a person who loves this region, somebody who wants to see everybody succeed, and who wants to give something back to a community that's been so good to me and my family. So I'm asking for your vote on Election Day to be your next state senator, and I can hardly wait to get to work. Senator O'Brien. 
There's a lot at stake in this election for your family, for my family, and for all of us who love this community. My vision of the future begins with the dreams I have for my own young daughters. When they grow up, I want them to find great jobs that allow them to raise their own families right here, rather than try to survive in an economy that's driven so many young people away. I want them to be able to venture out in a city that's flourishing and not torn apart by the problems of violence and poverty. And I want them to live in a state where their rights are respected and their standing as full and equal citizens is never in doubt. In my first term, I've helped move us closer to making that vision a reality. I've also learned that there's no script or even a teleprompter that's going to give us the answers to solving these complex challenges. The path forward lies in hard work and thoughtful problem solving. That's what I bring to the table, and that's why virtually every group has a stake in our region's future, and the Democrat and Chronicle are supporting me. I'm Ted O'Brien, and I'm a dad working as hard as I can to give my daughters the opportunities they deserve. With your help, I'll keep fighting to build a better, more promising future for all of our children. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And that concludes tonight's debate. We want to thank both of our candidates for joining us tonight. Of course, our panelists as well for proposing those questions to them. And now we would want to remind you that we will be replaying tonight's debate Sunday, November 2nd at 6.30 a.m. We'll also be posting video of tonight's debate on WHEC.com. Now, News 10 ABC will have continuing coverage of all the local races up to and on Election Day. We invite you to join us for extended coverage on election night. We'll have live results as they come into our newsroom right here on News 10 NBC and at WHEC.com. And we will want to remind you that your vote is your voice, so we encourage you to go out and let your voice be heard. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.